So um, I believe that good nutrition can actually promote our immune system, that uh, we can actually wore off um, the chronic illness, you know, things like cancer, heart disease, and even brain health. Um, so I'm just really excited to share with you uh, my vision for the future nutrition. So um, if you could just uh, bear with me, uh, since I'm talking about nutrition throughout life, so I'm going to, let's see if this works. <laughs> I think... Uh, Everything. Push it real hard. Push real hard. Yeah. Okay. I did. <laughs> no, it's not moving. Okay, let me see. Okay, try it now. Okay. Ah, good. Some <laughs> little difficulties facing in life sometimes. Uh, oh, now it's forwarding for me. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. So before I start, um, I would like to uh, uh, let you know that my presentation is interactive. I would much prefer if you have any questions, you know, during my presentation, just stop me and and you know raise your hand. You know, we'll talk about it. If you have any questions, you know, we'll answer it. Uh, and uh, so I have a first question for you all here. Um, any one of you here has little babies? Oh, okay. Well, share this with your friends. <laughs> well, since I'm a board certified pediatric nutrition, we always like to start talking about, you know, the first stage of life, which is the infant nutrition. So when we talk about this precious little life come to the world, now how are we going to feed this precious baby? Um, so I like to point you out this uh, wonderful human milk. And we're still studying it right now. It's still a mystery how it's made and how it's uh, uh, providing the excellent uh, nutrition sources for the baby. Uh, even the formula company tried to mimic the human milk to provide you know, as much as it can uh, the best nutrition for the infants. Now, um, First of all, this uh, human milk is alive. It's packed with actually enzyme that's passing through from mothers to babies. And uh, it has antibodies, microphages, that's ready to attack any bacteria that is you know, coming to the baby. And uh, the enzyme, however, it's very interesting. It's uh, coming from the mother to the baby in the breast milk, but it does not digest until it reaches the baby's gut. And then it starts acting. Otherwise, you know, think about breast milk. It has carbohydrate, it has fat, it has protein. What if it starts digesting before it gets to the baby, right? So everything is just working out beautifully, um, let alone the brain development. Um, the newest study shows uh, in Brown's University that uh, they did the MRI study and find out that the babies who are exclusively breastfed using human milk has a better enhancement of uh, brain development in the white matter, which is very important um, for, the, for the brain. Uh, so they find out that they have a better growth compared to uh, infants who are partially breastfed or partially using human milk or exclusively formula fed. Um, but, uh, there's also psychological effect. They find that um, the infants who are breastfed are more likely to recognize uh, human uh, uh, mood, mother's mood. So you might have a better chance to bring out a teenager who actually listened to you. <laughs> That's my dream. <laughs> uh, so any of these uh, benefit that if the formula company can mimic, they'll charge you one drop a million dollars. So in order to save your bank account, <laughs> why don't you just feed your baby the breast milk? Uh, so, um, and uh, they find out 
infants who are exclusively breastfed for four to six months actually has uh, less incidence of obesity and type 2 diabetes and for uh, mothers who actually um, breastfed uh, they have less uh, uh, cancer rate of the breast cancer and also other gynecological uh, cancer. So, okay, yeah, so um, I'm going to have to talk a little more, but you can share these information with your friends who are, uh, you know, deliver a young one. Uh, so um, we also find that uh, in the beginning of the breastfeeding process, when the baby latch on and suck on the first few uh, minutes of uh, breast milk, it's actually higher in, con uh, in carbohydrate content. It tasted sweet. So uh, the baby will say, hmm, I'm hungry and this tasted good. I'm going to just keep drinking and drinking. And then while the baby is gradually emptying that breast, the fat content starts to get higher and higher. So it's telling baby it's about time to stop. So that could be the reason later on in the, in the child's life they have more of a sense of when to stop eating. So they have less incidence of diabetes and all that. Um, so uh, it's uh, even interesting that mothers produce different milk for baby boys and baby girls. It doesn't sound very fair, but it's actually a study by Scientific America. There is the article 2012 and find out that um, kind of interesting data. So, oh, okay, let's keep going. Okay, so now we know the benefit of it. How long shall we do it? The World Health Organization, which is WHO, recommend at least two years, and uh, they set for the first four to six months, we should just exclusively um, provide the human milk. And in America, we cut it short. <laughs> One year, okay, and that's what the pediatrician is hoping that uh, most mothers will do. Um, so, let's see. This is uh, a little graph that I draft for you. Uh, for human milk uh, macronutrient, there's protein, there's, oh, shoot, I can't, <laughs> okay, let's see, there should be a pointer here somewhere, well, you can see there's a protein right there, which one gram provides four calories, okay, perfect, thank you. <laughs> So the protein provides four calories per gram, fat provides nine calories per gram, carbohydrate four, four calories per gram. So I, uh, if you look at per 100 calorie, what does human milk provide for the baby? Only four to five percent is coming from protein. 54 percent is fat, and another 42 percent is, uh, is carbohydrate. So. Human milk is notoriously high in fat, and that's very crucial for little kids' brain development because our brain is made with cholesterol and, you know, choline and fat. So this is very important for the brain development. So next slide. Now we have a child who just reached one year old there, uh, this is the breast milk here, the royal purple color, and here's the red whole milk, cow's milk. Now, if you see, compared to the cow's milk, your protein level is four times more than the human milk. By the way, um, the formula company is trying to formulate the baby formula according to uh, human milk composition, so they try to give uh, lower protein, mimicking uh, mother's milk uh, protein content. But at one year old, you have this little child that's ready to move on to the next stage. Their kidney is not four times bigger, but suddenly we throw them in the dark and start to feed them 
just cow's milk. And the cow's milk has less fat, still breast milk has more fat at this point, and then more carbohydrate. Obviously, we have to compensate the, to the fact that there's less protein. And it has, the human milk has less uh, calcium and phosphorus content than the cow's milk. Interesting enough, the babies still grow up with strong bones. So you have this uh, graph that I just show you. If we just suddenly transition a child who has been drinking 32 ounces of human milk or formula, and suddenly they start drinking 32 ounces of whole milk, just guess what will happen to their little kidney. The kidneys start to be panicking, trying to clear off all the protein. Uh, we call the cow's milk with high renal solute load. It just means that, you know, your kidney is kind of like a beautiful uh, garbage disposal. <laughs> Whatever you eat, you know, it's trying the best to maintain a balance in your body so that you can uh, continue to maintain a homeostatus uh, point of your blood. And then uh, this, this little kid suddenly encounters 32 ounces of milk protein from the cows. Um, that now the, the kidney is trying to panically uh, getting rid of all the waste that is produced afterward. And so I will be called um, by these you know, physicians trying to, evaluate, trying to evaluate why those kids now suddenly won't eat. Because with the 32 ounces of whole milk, they're full. They don't want to eat any other solids. And that's not good because we need a balanced nutrition. And with just these uh, cow's milk, we're not going to provide a little child with adequate balanced nutrients. So this is why it uh, makes me worried when we just transition suddenly to um, cow's milk for the little child um, who just reached one. And uh, so I understand though, um, with, for kids who are with DCC or ACC, um, it is a difficult situation to feed them. Now, how many of you here has children with DCC, ACC? Oh, all of you, of course. This is the conference for you all. I am so happy to be here. <laughs> you guys are precious. Because uh, I, I, I work for an early intervention program, so uh, I, I take care of uh, kids with uh, ACC, actually. You know, I have a lot, um, um, uh, a little case load of ACC. So I know that it's difficult for you uh, to try to feed them, um, especially breast milk. I know how difficult it could be. Now, any one of you has fed them breast milk before? Oh, congratulations! <laughs> you provide the liquid gold for your baby, and that is the, the best gift you can give them uh, as, as they grow up. I really congratulate you. Because it is hard, um, because they don't really suck very well. Do you find that? They have uh, inadequate um, sucking um, and swallow, uh, in, in, a little incoordination of um, you know suck and swallow pattern, and their muscle tone is uh, sometimes low, so they may not get enough your breast milk uh, to be is established. So, uh, for us to try to continue to provide good human milk for them is to try even starting from the hospital. If you ever feel that your baby is just not sucking enough, not latching on well, you can always ask for the cons uh, lactation consultant to help you out. Uh, the nutritionist in the hospital, you know, if they don't have a lactation consultant, which is very rare, uh, they're usually made of nurse. And, and then uh, on your own, you can continue to establish a good flow by pumping every two to three hours. I have some mom that has very good results, a uh, very good uh, establishment of uh, milk supply after this um, uh, maneuver. So, next one. Oops. Okay, 
so there are also contradiction if your baby actually has a condition called galactosemia, which is uh, they cannot uh, process uh, the milk uh, byproduct, which is the galactose, then you really don't want to provide uh, any type of milk. You might switch to the soy formula uh, just because uh, genetically they just cannot tolerate it. And also, if the mother has uh, the situation listed below, uh, it is not uh, recommended. However, for um, mothers with the other condition, like you have a fever, or even hepatitis B, hepatitis C, um, you just had a little boost, and <laughs> if you're jaundiced, it is still okay to, to breastfeed, so, or to provide your human milk to pump. So no worry about these conditions. Um, so especially for kids, Yes, you have a question? You just made a comment about soy milk. Um, yes. Is it, so just based on what you were suggesting about the cow's milk, if we have children that are using cow's milk now, a couple years old, is, it, is a soy milk a better alternative? You mean kids with galactosemia or? Uh, just in general. Oh, just in general. Yeah. Um, From a protein perspective, the, the other thing you mentioned. The same thing happens. Soy milk is trying to mimic cow's milk, so they put lots of protein in there as well. So if we can, I, you know, I always recommend to continue um, to, to pump uh, or use the next stage um, formula. Have you heard of, you know, the next stage? Uh, next step, they call it. It's kind of still mimicking the breast milk uh, content, you know, and continue to provide. So that's a very good question. So uh, let's keep looking for the next slides. Uh, so in terms of uh, BCC, ACC, uh, mothers might encounter insufficient sucking. So your breast milk establishment might not be good enough. So it's empirical, um, um, important that we just have to kind of monitor their hydration status. If your baby continue to cry after, you know, the feeding, uh, you probably want to know uh, if they're actually getting anything out from you. Uh, so you want to sometimes even pump to find out how much milk is there. If they're looking lethargic, you know, they might even have uh, something hypoglycemia, you know. Uh, so you want to still maybe supplement a little bit just because your baby in the beginning just doesn't have enough while you continue to pump to help them, uh, help yourself establish a good flow. So, uh, okay, so the next slides come. Uh, so we are uh, sufficiently providing our babies with at least four to six months of human milk supply. And now your baby might be interested uh, and what you eat, this is my little granddaughter. <laughs> she got to my daughter's uh, uh, green smoothie before <laughs> my daughter has a chance to get to it. So this is uh, a sign of uh, readiness because they'll be curious about what you're eating and, and their head support uh, is very good at this point. Uh, if they don't have a good head support, you probably don't really want to start the solids too soon. Uh, because there's texture issue that might be, you know, um, I'll show you in the next slides. Um, they have to show a decreased uh, tongue thrust. Uh, you know, if your baby continues to push food out of their tongue, they're not ready. Um, and if they're, they can hold up their head steadily, they're able to sit without support, uh, that's a good time to start um, feeding your baby with some uh, supplemental solids. And uh, for ACC, BCC uh, children, we want to expect, especially uh, be careful with their seating position because as you know, they're usually lower in tone. So in order to process all the different texture, their body has to be, you know, supportive. Um, uh, first of all, you have to make sure they're safe. To be fed. 
Um, and you might have to modify the food texture. You might want it to be more puree consistency so they can swallow okay uh, instead of choking. And their sitting position probably is 90 degrees upright. And they're sitting comfortably, feet supported uh, by some extra cushion so they can present you as a 90-90 degree so they can uh, process the salad easy. Uh, so here, I'm sure maybe some of, some of you in the audience will have some difficulty, uh, uh, difficult time uh, trying to provide the best uh, that you can from your kitchen for your baby. Um, they might just uh, refuse the feeding time. Uh, is anybody here uh, experiencing that in the past? No? Oh, good. You guys are having a good time feeding your baby. Now, um, when we have that kind of call, usually we have, um, um, I will do a thorough evaluation to find out why they're not eating because eating should be a uh, survival instinct. Kids, you know, just need to grow, so they should um, enjoy their feeding time. If they're not enjoying, uh, chances are that they're having some difficulties, maybe they're vomiting. Anybody of you here seen your baby vomit in the past? Okay, having extra gas, constipation, uh, crying af after or during feeding, arching, diarrhea, rashes, all these are signs that they're not really tolerating their feeding. And so we have to ask them, uh, why are they not tolerating their feeding? Is it because, you know, mechanically they have uh, tongue tie, some that condition can actually, God bless you, uh, can actually uh, decrease their growth uh, trend um, and uh, make them failure to thrive. So all it is, it's just very easy to just take your kid to the dentist and, and get a check out and you'll have, you know, a uh, better time feeding them. Or they might have some food sensitivity issues, celiac disease, uh, cystic fibrosis, metabolic disorder, slow gut motility. That's a condition that oftentimes can make them kind of gassy. And then, of course, uh, the brain um, um, uh, abnormality there. So, um, so if your child has uh, a food sensitivity issue <coughs> or intolerance, sometimes we cannot even detect it um, by the skin test or IgE test, which is the RAS test, R-A-S-T test, um, it most likely are going to be from your observation. You'll be the one that tell us, like, what is the food that they can tolerate and what is the food that they cannot. And so if you're a child, um, after you take them, taking them to the allergist, find out that they're actually po with positive reaction to casein or wheat, eggs, uh, nuts, uh, shellfish. Anyone of you here has a, this issue here? Oh yeah, right. Um, you definitely need to uh, be provided uh, or providing your, your child with the um, allergen-free diet, uh, which is usually uh, important at least for their first two years three of life so we can calm down the immune system so later on they can maybe retry uh, certain foods. Some of them never outgrow it. So, um, like the casein, peanuts, um, egg, sometimes we see outgrown, uh, the kids outgrow their allergy. Uh, but, so with this condition, we'll provide a nutrient balanced diet for them after we remove the allergen. And then we'll make sure that they continue to have a good bone mineral uh, mineralization in their diet. So. Uh, now we remove all the milk protein. You might ask, can we provide a good bone mineralization with this diet? We're um, routinely being told that milk is the only way to build our strong bones. Anybody hear about this theory, right? Yeah. Okay, here. I would like to, and this is, we're moving on to adulthood now. Your bone health. So, um... I like epidemiological study because when we study the population, we get a lot of little clues like how we can better improve our own diet. Now, this journal of osteoporosis actually 
um, publicate a very interesting study. They find out, I know the print is so small, I try to help you out and do a little summary here, that people in the Scandinavian countries, in the U.S., have actually the highest rate of bone fractures. Now, if you think about it, we actually have the highest intake of dairy. It's very hard for me, actually, to design a diet that's just kind of ready to go for Americans to actually do a dairy-free diet is tricky in this country. So we actually have the highest intake of dairy, but why are we having the highest bone fracture? They also find out people in African country actually has the lowest bone fracture rate. And people in Asian countries has, has uh, immediate, uh, intermediate uh, rate of bone fracture. And Northern Europeans have a uh, higher bone fracture rate than the Southern European. Again, Northern Europeans tend to have more uh, fat in their diet and also more um, uh, dairy product. So um, we all want a healthy diet. Because why? Anybody want to tell me why you want a healthy diet? I know you don't want to have that bone fracture, you want to have quality of life. And you want to live longer. This is the top 20 countries that live the longest um, among the whole world. So the top one is Monaco, <laughs> and the second one is Japan. Uh, sometimes Japan moved to the number one, and so it's just kind of like, you know, and then San Marino, they sometimes move to number one. It just depends. But the top five, if you look at them, uh, one, two, three, Macau is also from Asia. Asia. So top five, three of them are from Asian countries. So they don't that, milk. They don't drink milk. Well, I don't drink. I actually drink a little milk. I'm a milk. dietitian. I was sold by the dairy council that we should drink milk. <laughs> so I drink a little bit. But we actually, the Asians, they are seriously having a condition called lactose intolerance. So a lot of them cannot drink milk. But they don't have higher bone fracture. You can, you can see that later on in their life. Um, but they eat so, a lot of vegetables, though. That's right. I love that point out. And then, then that's uh, what I'm going to talk next. And who can guess? Where is the U.S. stands for? At this <laughs> We have probably about 125 countries. 125 countries. We're ranked number 43. 43. Well, that's still bad. You know, we're not the top 20, but we can probably do something to help us out, don't? Can we? So let's see. The, uh, so I kind of like look into the typical diet of the Scandinavian diet, and this I sneak out from the internet and see their um, uh, highly estate uh, uh, menu ideas. This is from a cruise line that they will serve <laughs> as, as their food. Uh, they'll have like breakfast with scrambled eggs and bacon and <laughs> fried tomatoes. Ooh, a little fried tomatoes, that's at least a, a little good. And spinach is just in a little bit in the sauce. So, and then they have more fried eggs with bacon and beef steak with cheese, and then uh, uh, more scrambled eggs with bacon for breakfast, you know, beef uh, with butter and vegetable of your choice. We got a little vegetables here. So, uh, here, <laughs> let's find a typical American diet. And here's, uh, I'm talking about the bones, and here is the bone poison. I want to bring out to you, everybody. If you just, uh, you know, didn't like my lecture, but at least take home this lesson about this um, Coke, Diet Coke, phosphoric containing soft drinks are the worst for your bone status. So, I can dispute it, that one because I've been drinking them for about 70 years and no problem. I oh, quit drinking them, but this is all I can find here to drink. <laughs> Okay. So I can just do that one, but well, I know. I maybe uh, you have a better chromosome. <laughs> you can I better know. tolerate it. But uh, yeah, in general, in it's, general, a, yeah, it's a pretty bad <laughs> bone poison. So okay, here's another typical picture of the our teenagers' diet. You can see, in you know, at breakfast maybe they have something like you know the donuts and then lunch and dinner. And here's a typical African 
diet. This is an Ethiopian um, plate. And here is a little bit of a folic rich, uh, enriched uh, collard green right here. And there's some little more leafy green and some more beans uh, mixed with the protein meat and, and, and stuff. So, okay, so here's a typical Asian diet. <laughs> it's pretty boring looking, isn't it? With two vegetables already stir fried, and here is your meat. And wait a minute, there's more vegetable here, there's carrots, and then there's just a little bit of meat. Uh, and there's some a bowl of rice right there. Uh, so. Our diet is actually very rich in the leafy green. So, um, more so, a kind of a leafy green that's called cruciferous family. Have you ever heard, heard about the cruciferous family? It's the uh, plant that has flowers shaped like a cross. And that we, uh, we group them as a, a group called cruciferous family. I'm a botanist too. When I was, you know, back in Taiwan, I. I study botany, so it's a, a particular interest to me. So we find out more and more that there's actually a lot of benefits from these cruciferous family here. And then we'll gradually um, evolve in telling you uh, what, what are they. And this is some plants. Look how green they are. Aren't they pretty? I love them. <laughs> so yes, um, this is called uh, Chinese called yu choy is a um, very buttery taste of uh, vegetables. You could just stir fry, chop it up, wash it out, and stir fry. And this is called Chinese broccoli. And this is called baby bok choy. And here's napa. And I believe this is probably uh, wasabi or some sort of a cruciferous family here. Um, again, um, majority of them are, all of them, are rich in vitamin K. You just mentioned about some ingredient. This is a newfound favorite here in building strong bones. I've been eating those all my life. You've been eating all? Maybe Maybe that's why you can fight that phosphoric acid in your Coke. (laughs) That's all I got to eat is greens. Greens. There you go. Okay. So let's talk about this beautiful leafy greens. They're rich in vitamin K. And how do we find about that they might have some protective... Um, in fact, on, on the bones is because any one of you here has heard about a medication called Coumadin, warfarin, yes. right? Blood thinner. And you can't eat when those you start, that yeah, when you start that medication, your dietitian will tell you, I try to stay away from the fever. Yeah. And so we study those populations <laughs> who actually try hard to stay away from the leafy green. And 25 of them, 25 percent of them, has increased risk of osteoporosis. And there we got it. We find that maybe our greens are actually also helping us with our healthy bones. And here we are. We all need healthy bones. That's a very important factor for us to carry on with our daily life, isn't it? So here is a graft for you all to uh, uh, take home and enjoy your greens. Uh, You should be um, taking care of yourself by eating at least, women should have two and a half cups of uh, vegetables per day, and men should have, have at least three cups. And I'm sure you, ma'am, you probably have six cups. I know, that's all I need, because I'm not a meat eater, so. <laughs> that's fine. But I don't lose no weight, so. Yeah, oh, well, <laughs> but you are a heart potato, heart healthy. Yeah, so, okay, here's a, uh, anybody have any questions so far? Yes. So, getting back to the greens. Yes. So, is there a certain way you have to prepare them to still have the most, or can I, like, make a cream soup out of any of those? Very good question. I love this question. Now, uh, with, um, I would put it as such. With certain ingredients, uh, such as the cruciferous family, you actually want to cook it a little bit. So with your kale green, somebody likes to throw it into your fruit smoothie and just shake it up like, just like that. Um, It's actually not as uh, protective as if you just stir fry a little bit. So the cruciferous family is better off to kind of stir fry. Um, Not too long. Um, The folate, however, 
The fully aspect is that if you uh, actually cook it too long, you might actually destroy the folate. So it's sensitive to heat. So you have your spinach and all the other um, foods, which I'll show you later on in the slides. You actually, you know, don't want to cook it too much. So the uh, take home lesson is cook it just a little bit. So some nutrients can start to come out and help you with your, um, you know, your gene to re repair and all that. And also your folate. Um, Adequacy. So that's a very good question. Thank you. So, um, that's, um, anybody else? Yeah. Um, when you stir fry it, what type of oil should you use for like to do the leafy greens? That's a very good question too. I like that. Some oil are heat sensitive, so you actually don't want to use that um, a lot. What I I try to work on my stir fry is. I, uh, I generally use a very um, iron pot. I do not like those coating ones because that does not um, achieve the sufficient heat. So I actually um, heat up my pan on the iron um, you know, quality and make it real hot. And as I get to make sure that it's really hot, you know, we throw a little uh, water in there, you'll see the water particle become a little beads, then you know your iron is iron pot is ready. And then you throw in your vegetable first. And then you pour in a little oil. You know, some oil are more um, resistant to heat, like, you know, the coconut oil. Um, extra virgin, I like that. Extra virgin is better than, you know, just more um, solidified. Um, you know, toward um, middle of your cooking. So it's not, still not that hot. And I use just a little bit, just enough to add the flavor and I add water to do the rest of the simmering. So and I quickly stir fry it and you know in two or three minutes you can enjoy your greens. So it's super easy. And some greens actually shrink after you cook it. So you achieve the benefit of double the amount that you can use. So yeah. <coughs> uh, okay, here is the Coke. <laughs> Pepsi yes. is the high of phosphoric acid. I learned that from taking care of the dialysis patients when the kidney is not working. You this see is the worst the step forward. Yes, you see the imbalance of phos phosphoric acid rising up in their blood, and they start to kick out the calcium in their blood, and they have horrible bones. So we tell them not to drink Coke, not to drink Pepsi, or anything that has. Some soft drink can even put phosphoric acid without calling themselves Coke or Pepsi. You yeah. have to really read the label. So it's usually toward the end of the label, you know, you'll see this little menace hiding in there. <laughs> so, okay, so now we come to a low, a low fat map diet. This is a diet Anybody, have you experienced this diet? Oh. I've experienced it, but I've been researching it for my son. Yes, okay. This is a diet uh, that's been researched on, uh, first published by Monash uh, University in Australia. And what they are is they're trying to help kids or adults that has uh, irritable bowel syndrome. Um, they oftentimes, um, excuse me, uh, have, um, uh, intolerance for all these foods. I call this bummer diet. <laughs> Why? Because unfortunately, um, some uh, it's usually coming from carbohydrate. Um, uh, they are fermentable oligosaccharides and disaccharides and monosaccharides and polios. Okay, so all these together is called FODMAP. So that's the, um, the word uh, kind of shortened for all these ingredients. So we want them to be low for kids or adults with IBD um, uh, symptoms. So what are those little um, things that you can find um, with oligosaccharides? So here, it actually was um, studied by uh, a lot of people, um, people from University of Michigan and study uh, naive subjects, and they actually find it that it's pretty helpful if we can remove these uh, 
agent in your diet um, that may be bothering you. So oligosaccharides such as um, wheat, rye, you know, or gluten containing products, um, garlic, onion, um, or legumes like your beans and um, it might produce uh, the, um, the uh, oligosaccharides that <coughs> later on ferment in the gut and causing gassiness for your child or yourself. Uh, so we try to remove them. And the lactose. Lactose is the um, uh, disaccharides that we find. So the yogurt and cheese you know, generally are uh, fine, um, a little harder on their system. And then the fructose. Fructose is another uh, menace uh, that's in this diet. So uh, foods high in fr um, high fructose corn syrup is usually a no-no uh, for uh, these population. And so we want to eliminate food that has the highest uh, FODMAPs ingredient in there. Like, you know, uh, you find your child have problem with um, high fructose corn syrup, um, agave, molasses, honey, apples, mango, watermelon, um, all these um, can be prunes, can be a potential um, discomfort source for your, your child or you. Um, lactose, yeah, lactose, um, like milk, uh, even sheep's milk, goat's milk, you know, they all have lactose in them, so you probably you know, want to avoid them. And the fructanes is the one that I just mentioned, uh, you know, find in cauliflower, broccoli, the cruciferous family. Um, they might have an um, agent that's uh, irritating uh, to you. But uh, the University, of, uh, Stanford University still um, indicated that in small amount of broccoli, they usually can still tolerate it. So, um, so the trick is um, in small amounts, because we still don't want them to avoid these wonderful ingredients um, in their diet. Yeah. So do you find that your child or you is better off without the broccoli and uh, Yeah, like I can, him and I have the same thing, and I can, I can pick off ones that yeah. really bother us. Yes, that's right. And try to use more of the other. Okay which I'll show you, yeah. And the legumes, like the beans, uh, peas, chickpeas, you know, those pistachio, cashew, hummus, um, those can be uh, a, a galactin source too. And the polios, so like uh, artificial sweetener, sorbitol, mannitol, isomalt, xylitol, all these stone fruits, uh, even avocado can be a potential uh, irritable agent for them. So uh, what are the foods that you can eat then? So sometimes uh, we substitute. Uh, you still want to monitor though. Um, I have a, a little uh, uh, client that actually cannot even tolerate uh, things like banana. So he can pretty much only use cantaloupe. No grapes, no kiwi, so uh, no oranges. <laughs> so every child can be even different. So what you can do is monitor what is the best um, that you can provide for your uh, little kid and yourself. And the vegetables, we recommend that you can still try bok choy. That is still a cruciferous family, but it's less irritable. You can try that. And um, alfalfa, bean sprouts, bamboos, carrots, cucumber, those are still okay. And then milk. We pretty much want to reduce uh, or actually eliminate. I find that this column is actually the most problematic. Um, they just cannot tolerate. So we end up using rice milk. I'm sorry. Yeah, this is the low FODMAP group. So we end up using rice milk, oat milk, or casein-free um, product, yogurt and stuff. And the grains, they can use gluten-free grains, which is like millet, uh, tapioca, rice, sorghum, quinoa, you know, Sometimes corn, I didn't put it there, but I just um, have this kid who can't even tolerate corn. So I just, you know, corn, since they're high fructose corn syrup, they can't tolerate, so I kind of just eliminate that in general. And the sweetener, you can still use sugar <laughs> and the glucose. So 
uh, that's still okay food to, to give. So anybody has any questions so far? Yes. I just wanted your opinion on the lactose-free milk yes. that is mm -hmm. in the grocery store. A uh, very good question. Uh, so it's um, very complicated um, when we find out a kid is actually sensitive to milk. Um, there are two ingredients in your milk that could be a potential assaulting agent. It could be the lactose or it could be the casein. So with your child, you have to monitor. You can start with lactose-free milk or even use lactase. There's an enzyme that you can give. But watch them. If they still have constipation, they still you know, show kind of tummy ache after they drink lactose-free milk, they might not even tolerate the casein. So that's one thing that could be uh, another assaulting agent that you want to figure out. So um, you guys are all the detectives. So you'll be <laughs> walking your child step by step and checking to see what is best for you. Yeah, that's a very good question. So, any other question here? Okay. So we're going to keep moving on. Um, so this is my little case study with a child that I take care of. Um, he has partial deletion of chromosome 2 and 17. Uh, when I saw him, um, there's no really a special diet at this point for him. Uh, so he constantly cannot tolerate any formula. So when I saw him, he was on the final choice that the medical field can offer him, which is the amino acid-based um, formula, infant formula, uh, toddler formula, with high corn syrup. Uh, and he's not tolerating. And at that time when I saw him, uh, he was only 19 months, not walking, not talking, not communicating, just lying there. It's very sad. So we put our heads together, we keep looking, and at 23 months, we actually discovered that he has high, uh, he has this uh, fructose intolerance um, issue. And the GI doctor doesn't know, you know, he, we have found all kinds of doctors to help him out, and it's uh, just, you know, by God's grace, we find out through um, a coincidence that mom just fed him a little cherry, and suddenly the kid's belly just blew up, and cherry is high in the fructose. So we started to look for the FODMAP diet, FODMAP diet low FODMAP diet for him, and we discontinue the formula right away. And guess what we use? We, he has a G2. He can't eat. So we actually puree all the safe food for him and administer through the syringe uh, through the G2 for him. And um, we use the, the low fat man foods. And guess what happened? This kid actually one day seeing his mom puring all the food and trying to uh, push it through his G2, he grabbed his mom's cup and dipped his little finger there and started to eat directly from that cup. And from then on, we don't even need to use the G2 to feed him. He's feeding himself by mouth. And later on, he started his own oral feeding. He started to stand. He started crawling. He started walking, communicating. So just imagine how you know, exhilarating the parents are because they, they look at the kid at 19 months, they couldn't imagine that one day he's going to walk, he's going to communicate, he's going to talk. So, so this is just how um, terrific that actually diet can, can pose an impact on yourself and your children. So, this is why I'm absolutely passionate about good nutrition here, uh, because uh, we do see um, a big turnaround um, for kids. Um, so next is uh, another, well, uh, being researched uh, area here is ketogenic diet. Uh, Any one of you here has been using ketogenic diet? Uh, yeah? Okay. Gotcha. Uh, this is a diet that uh, one of you probably have heard about it. Uh, 
from the doctor this morning uh, that talks about um, a ketogenic diet. It's a diet that is very, very high in fats, very, very low in carb, and just enough amount of protein uh, to promote the kid's growth and in hope that you can stop the seizure. Now, if you think about uh, seizure activity, um, any of you here experienced uh, seizure or your child? Okay, all right, yes. So um, the thought behind this diet is that um, using the fact that our brain is uh, primarily using glucose as a fuel to perform different activities in our brain. And by cutting off that supply um, using no carb or low, very extremely low carb, and the body start go through some similar uh, starvation status and produce ketose, ketosis, ketones. And that ketone will then uh, go into the bloodstream, the liver will start to mobilize the fat in your body store and start to provide the brain with ketones as a fuel. Uh, so we do that in hope that the brain cells will then start to calm down and produce less seizure. And we use this primarily for kids who are shown to have no effect from using um, <coughs> uh, anti-seizure medication. Tons of anti-seizure medication is applied, uh, but still we see no improvement. Uh, then we might consider this. And this is a, a, it's not a new thing in biblical time. Uh, Jesus has talked about it in Matthew and Mark that this kind of activity can, only can be um, get rid of through prayer and fasting. So in the 1920s, actually um, in um, Aristotle's time, some uh, people are experiencing, we just fast these uh, people and see uh, what they're, uh, what, it can help them with. So um, in 1920s and 30s, um, people have interest in, in taking a look at this diet again. Um, you know, we, we make the children fast and we pray. And, and then in the 1990s, uh, there's multi-center studies with, on this high-fat, moderate protein and low-carb diet uh, for the uh, kids with uh, seizure, uh, uncontrollable seizure. It started... Um, uh, most famous uh, Johns Hopkins University um, started to do a lot of um, maneuver on this diet. And usually um, it's uh, uh, indicated for children with drug-resistant epilepsy and um, especially indicated if they have Dravet syndrome, infantile spasm, mild chronic astatic epilepsy, and tuberous sclerosis complex. And so if your child um, are diagnosed with these conditions, it might be beneficial to try uh, these out. And for children with uh, metabolic disorders such as pyruvate dehydrogenase E1 deficiency and glucose transport 1 deficiency syndrome, it's imperatively that we will recommend this diet because their body cannot tolerate carbohydrate. There are lack of this enzyme that can um, metabolize the carbohydrate. So we have to use this ketogenic diet. So any questions on this slide? Can you see the slide before that, just oh. one second? Yes, of course. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, uh, thanks to the um, Charlie Foundation in the 1990s, I, I should, um, con you know, contribution to that, um, that, that they actually uh, uh, funded those centers to find out if this is a um, good diet to start children with uh, uncontrolled seizure. So, and for some kids, actually, uh, with this condition, we, we have found some um, pretty profound um, success uh, for kids. Uh, however, there's also absolute contraindication. So for kids with pyruvate carboxylase deficiency, you do not want to use this diet. And porphyria, uh, fatty acid, uh, acid oxidation defects, you do not want this diet. Because, why? 
they lack the enzyme uh, to digest, uh, to metabolize the fat. And this is a very high fat diet. So usually your child will be evaluated by a neurologist slash geneticist and find out if they can rule out your child is actually having trouble um, with these conditions that we don't, we do not want to start this diet on your children. Yes? I just wanted to mention something. Um, our child was on the ketogenic diet. He was having seizures every week. And it was successful. It was a lot of work, but we found that um, a trigger that was on the ketogenic diet was aspartame. Aspartame causes seizures in some kids, so we were giving yes. him um, the sugar-free jello that was part of the ketogenic diet, yes. and oh every dear. time he had that, that night he had a seizure until we figured it out. Once we eliminated anything with the aspartame, it worked really well. Yeah. And so I just want to throw that out there in case anybody wants to try the ketogenic diet, just watch out for it. For the artificial sweetener. Yes. I really yes. appreciate that. That is a pretty common practice because kids like sweets. So yes. sometimes, you know, yes. the parents are trying that. And right. how about stevia? Did you check? Yeah, we didn't try that. Um, um, we were working with a dietitian, and she came up with a weekly menu for us. That was it was good, but yeah, he wanted the sweets, and we were trying to figure out well, what can we do. Right. Um, we ended up going with just him having some like natural gelatin, just flavored with a little bit of honey, that worked. Yeah. He, you know, as a kid, being nine years old, he wanted sweet. Yeah, you know, obviously. He his friends yeah. in school yeah. having it. So we've done workarounds. I mean, he's not on that diet anymore because mm -hmm. we've been able to manage the seizures. But he was on it for a good year, and once we yeah. got that piece of it resolved mm -hmm. with these artificial sweeteners, so it was a good diet. It's just, it is like... You know, you said a very high fat. Yeah, it's very, yeah. very high. 87% at yeah. least to start with. So I really appreciate your input. That is tremendous. Yes. Uh, very good. Excellent. So, um, yes, so this is a very high fat diet. And uh, um, usually we start them in the hospital and uh, we um, will have a dietitian leading the team and the neurologist on board, registra uh, registered uh, nurse in the social work and pharmacist. Sometimes the medication even has carbohydrate in there that we need to kind of do a little manipulation to provide the best ratio for them. So, um, and Johns Hopkins University is uh, the famous one to start this uh, research on this diet, and this is their protocol. So you'll see they have to consult with the neurologist first uh, to see you know, if they can use this diet and they will select the, the ratio for them and we work it in in a slower ratio, like even you know, modified At Atkin diet to start with and then move on to one to one ratio, two to one. Uh, the most beneficial one is starting, you start to see the benefits on four to one ratio. Was your child on the four to one ratio that you see the effect um, three to one? Yeah, we started on the modified Atkins first, and then we went to the ketogenic. Ketogenic, yeah. gotcha. Does your dietitian say that it's a three to one ratio? No, it, yeah, it was a three to one. Three to one, yeah. even that yeah. is helpful. Good, good. Sometimes we have to move on to more to four to one ratio uh, to see any effect. So that's very nice. So uh, what it is uh, uh, is. Uh, they, um, this is where if you want, if you're interested in that diet, then the a nutritionist usually will calculate for you. Um, for every, they weigh. First of all, you have to weigh your food. It's pretty cumbersome diet. You have to really use a scale to check every gram of your food because, as you know, um, any food has, uh, you know, three composition in there. There's fat. There's protein, there's carbohydrate. So some food has all the fat, like oil, butter. It has nothing but fat. But some food has some carbohydrate and protein, you know, like even avocado has a little carb in there. And, uh, you know, uh, your steak has some protein and fat in there. And, and you know, so, so we take 
uh, the, the particular food, and we uh, calculate how many fat, uh, how many grams of fat are there. Uh, for every gram of fat, you times nine, and you got a ratio of 36. And then every four, uh, this is the ratio that usually is pretty classic. That's when you start to see effect uh, a lot of times uh, to be on this diet. So I'm glad that your child can use three to one even as a lower ratio. Uh, but usually we start um, with three to one and then we move on to four to one. And then you have uh, 36 unit plus one unit of protein and carbohydrate. So these two has only four gram, uh, a one per, uh, Per gram of these two nutrients has four calories. So they have to share this one. Therefore, you have 36 calories from the fat for every six, for every 36 calories, you only have four calories from your protein and carbohydrate. So this is the principle of getting that diet to start. Um, sometimes we oftentimes use uh, this uh, calculation uh, from uh, the computer, it's called keto. A calculator and so just to show you uh, the, the grand scheme of this <laughs> diet is that you almost cannot eat bread because just half a slice of bread in order to reach the 4 to 1 ratio you will have to use 3.5 tablespoon of oil and the kid has to eat every drop of it. It's not very palatable and so um, so you pretty much kind of just forget about using bread, or very little bread can be used. Forget about half a slice, you, you pretty much just can use like a crumb or something, just to satisfy the taste bud. Um, so you don't have to pour down 3.5 tablespoons of oil. And, and the kids usually only need 800 to 1,000 calories, and here, 500 calories gone for just that half slices of bread, so we cannot use that. Therefore, yeah. Uh, so, um, yeah, it is very hard on the, on the child, but sometimes we do see a great turnaround on these children, so it's almost worth it uh, to try it out, especially if you don't have the condition that is contradicting uh, to this diet. Uh, for adults, somehow, it does not show that much effect. Um, I don't know, maybe kids are still growing their brain, so for every seizure that, that is um, putting an impact on the child's brain, we would like to see it you know, decrease so the brain can continue to develop. As the adult stage, the brain is already developed, so we don't see as much effect for the adult. Yeah. So, any questions on this side? Okay. So. Uh, for the ketogenic diet, we pretty much want to achieve adequate amount of calories to provide for your, yourself and your, ch or your ch children mostly uh, with high fat diet, very low carbohydrate. And the 3 to 1 ratio will give you about 87% calories from fat. And imagine, we, the American um, diet is generally consists of 40% fat. And so 30% calorie is from fat is actually a healthy diet, so compared to that, healthy diet is very, very, you know, um, high in fat. So, and this is just three to one ratio. When you go to four to one, it's 90 percent. So, okay, here it comes to, uh, when we come to this beautiful chart again, we see the U.S. is ranking number 43. I want to show you all these, um, uh, epidemiological study because we want to learn what is impacting our health um, by studying uh, these people's diet uh, regularly. And we, f uh, we find that a common fact that people with high life expectancy usually eat foods that are like this. They have lots of color, lots of taste. It's like a food fast here, isn't it? So they're common in vegetables and fruits, mushrooms and all these, you know, wonderful vegetables and fruits. And the root vegetables here, there's the carrots and sweet potato. Um, 
and they're common in the cruciferous family. The Italians eat rapa. Have you heard about rapa? That's very common in their, in their diet, and that is also another cruciferous family. And they're also high in fish, uh, seeds, uh, and beans, nuts, more fruits and vegetables. So this is kind of an interesting point. So we look at their diet in general. Um, have you heard about the Okinawa uh, study, diet study? Um, people in Japan, especially in that region called Okinawa, um, Okinawa's um, region, they, people there eat fewer calories than uh, in general. Um, their men usually consume about 1,700 calories per day versus, compared to us, about 2,500 calories. Uh, so they're almost halfway there. Uh, and they have lots of variety of vegetables, and they have some fruits. And um, the Mediterranean diet has uh, lots of seeds and nuts and fish, and just a little bit of meat, poultry, and dairy and wheat. And they have no prepackaged foods. <laughs> this is kind of a out, like you said, the aspartame is just not good. We don't know. You know how much actually we when we buy those um, products. Actually, University of Iowa did a study showing that kids get hyperactive with food additives such as food coloring. What do you think about it? You make a little cake. You know, it's kind of like harmless. You just you know for the red velvet cake, you just dump some red food coloring. And these actually are studied by. Um, these professionals and find that for autistic kids or kids in general it actually cause hyper active uh, hyper um, activity so you know kids tend to not paying attention um, to the things that you said you know and they're just like Pew, 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 everywhere so um, I do not go for prepackaged foods um, I know it could be hard but there's some ways that we can just enjoy our family time with just simple food yes I'm not organic Yes, that's another source that, um, that's recommended for people, especially um, if you still want to drink milk, I definitely recommend organic milk. And organic meat, they actually find out that it has higher ratio of omega-3 fatty acids, which is more beneficial for us. Um, uh, Grass-fed meat, I know it's very much more expensive. That's why we just eat a little bit. A little bit of meat. And that's what happened with those countries that uh, has high longevity, longevity rates. Um, they just don't need a lot of meat so we can still afford organic food. And uh, vegetables, yes. And it's, um, it's just so much sprayed here. It's better to just use um, organic leafy greens and, if you can. But, you know, it's all the effect of dilution. If you just, you know, once in a while have some, in, you know, not so organic food, that's still okay the majority of the time, you know, you enjoy it. So, so that's a very good question. And uh, I always enjoy family meal time. You know, that's the time that you can all sit together, you know, enjoy the day and just relax with each other, um, you know, with some simple food provided, just, you know, that's really helping for the um, healthy lifestyle um, for people. Yeah. So, okay, here's the most famous graph again. I use that because then I want to show you a different rate of um, death rate from different diseases. A World Health Organization find out um, they study different countries here. So the first one is usually I pick out the highest cancer rate country, actually the highest uh, death rate from cancer uh, is Armenia. Uh, look at their, their numbers, 229.84 people died um, per 100,000 um, deaths. So this is the US. We're Kind of 
halfway there. <laughs> uh, it's still not very impressive. And as you move on to Iceland, um, it's comparable to us. Italy is a little bit less. Yes. What's, what's with Armenia? They eat a lot of raw meat, don't they? Um, I don't know, maybe environmental yeah. pollution. Armenia. I know they like raw meat. Yeah, in that Eastern so. Europe. Yeah. 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 yeah, I know, that's a very good. Yeah. yeah. We see in Russia as well. They have. The next one is Russia and all the Stan country, you know, Pakistan, you know, all those countries, they have high um, death rate of cancer. And probably their uh, healthcare system is not as well um, combated for the cancer rate. Yeah. But look at Singapore. It's only down to 100. So that's a very good um, situation there. So. Uh, now, that's right from heart disease. So you can see uh, the first one is Turkey Ministan. Uh, the second one, US is actually not too bad considering we're down to two digits <laughs> instead of three digits. And um, the Singapore is not doing very well in here. <laughs> I think it's probably stress, lifestyle can also affect um, the heart disease. Um, yeah. And Japanese, however, they're pretty stressful too, but they still can get down to 30. Yeah, that's pretty good. So, let's look at the cancer prevention. This cruciferous family, um, these are the common uh, kind that you can see. Arugula. Anybody like arugula? Yeah. Horseradish? Yeah, you can find it easily, right? Kale, radishes, rutabaga. Oh, I love all these. <laughs> the Chinese have just about like 10,000. No, I'm just joking. And we have at least 10 kinds of different cruciferous vegetables of different bok choy family. We can just, you know, enjoy, and each one tastes different. And you probably uh, eat some broccoli here and there, and cabbages, and uh, uh, Japanese eat wasabi with their fish. So all these are um, very helpful for your health uh, in cancer prevention. And uh, we just talked about doing a little cooking of these vegetables might be pretty helpful for those uh, chemicals to be released into uh, your system. So, yeah. Any uh, uh, questions on this slide here? I would encourage you to try more of these uh, stir fry or whatever you can do. Chew it up. <laughs> Let all the good ingredient nourish you. So, um, so people have hypothesized that maybe it's the indoles and the isothiocyanates that is helpful. So, the, so they isolate these ingredients and put it to rats and find that the rats actually have less bladder, breast, colon, liver, and lung cancer and stomach cancers. So they promote that, um, they hypothesize that this might be the effect that's uh, working on the body um, to help the, with the DNA damage uh, to dis, um, you know decrease the DNA damage, to repair DNA and to inactivate the carcinogens and uh, antibacterial, all these effects. So, oh, any questions on this one? No. Okay. Good. Now this is a small print. This is a printout from uh, NIH, uh, National Institute of Health, and uh, you can just. Go to there and check it out. But I want to point out their studies here. They actually find in the cohort study, which means um, we follow these samples, we follow these people uh, for a long term and check out if the diet actually has an effect on them. And we find that the Netherlands and the United States and the Europeans seem to have less effect when we put more cruciferous family in their diet with prostate cancer. However, I want to show you this however, but there's a case control studies, which is fine in um, other countries that actually have 
lower intake of dairy and fat, they actually have tremendous um, decrease in the prostate cancer. So we want the good vegetable in our diet, but it might work better in conjunction with your other food intake. <laughs> so, because all the foods kind of react with each other. You know, I believe that we eat food as a whole. We do not want to just kind of isolate, you know, extract those food um, nutrients to just focus on that. I believe, you know, that all the, actually nutrition is so complex. I, I appreciate a professor from Cornell University actually talk about that. It's so uh, complicated that we just cannot just isolate one compound and just take it out and say, this is what's good for you. We actually eat the whole thing. Like, you know, organic foods, just take it in to yourself and, and see the benefit that it comes. So, um, for the colon cancer, again, they find that in the United States and Netherlands, they have less effect uh, when they uh, try the cruciferous family. And, but um, uh, there's an exception uh, in the Netherlands where they find that uh, women uh, consume high intake of cruciferous family. They actually have reduced risk of colon cancer. And lung cancer is for sure finding um, a good help with the cruciferous family and breast cancer um, for a specific cohort study in women. Um, this, this is very interesting because it's a large sample study and they find out it actually fight breast cancer. So very interesting to know, isn't it? I love these foods. Brain health. So I also look at those um, people who live the longest. In the countries, I pick uh, the top 10, okay? Again, I pick US, I pick, actually, Finland has the highest rate of death from dementia, Alzheimer's disease, just Scandinavian countries. And the US, we're pretty close to them. And Iceland, interesting enough, isn't it? Scandinavian countries. And Italy, much lower. Italy is about ranking number 12 in the life expectancy there. Japan, number two. You would think that people live longer, tend to lose their mind easier, right? They're older, they tend to forget, they tend to have more chances of having dementia, but not in Japan and Singapore. Look at the number from Singapore. 0 0.19. So this is two digit. This is one digit. This is decimal point. What do they eat here? Again, more vegetables. Leafy greens. Leafy greens are also proven to be helpful for your brain health. So for your children, we want to provide them leafy greens as a young kid. Yes, go ahead. So a child who no way in the world will eat a leafy green, what about a supplement? Or yes. even if it's dry, even, you know what I'm talking about, you can pour in and it's just yes. Like yes. dry vegetables. Dry I don't food know. particles. I'm trying to figure out. I, I blend all my leafy greens into my spaghetti bowl. He <laughs> doesn't even know. Yeah. 500 grams worth of. The fruit smoothie. Yeah, they don't even know it's there. You tell them, you can make popsicles with the green and put a little lemon juice in there and tell them it's lemon popsicle. It looks green. They're like, oh, it's lime. Yeah. Or you will make your red velvet cake yeah. with beets. Yeah. They don't even know. Or brownies with black beans. Brownie with black beans. High delicious. Perfectly in there. I do, um, I do all kinds of, in the... Um, St. Patrick Day, I made green pancakes, and I told them, this is St. Patrick Day pancake. Everybody loves pancake, you know, they'll eat that. I even tried to start step by step. I cheated, I, I uh, take a zucchini, I peel the skin off, and I just use the inside first to get them used to the pancake that has zucchini in there, <laughs> instead of 
just regular flour, I put at least one whole zucchini in there, and then I gradually add in the skin, and then in St. Patrick's Day, we use the whole grain, you know, the kale green pancake. I make kale green chocolate muffin. <laughs> Nobody knows because the green is beautifully covered by the chocolate cocoa powder. You know, I don't even use chocolate in there. I just use cocoa powder, which is uh, rich in the pigments. That's good for, for them as well. Yes? Do you have a cookbook? <laughs> I, I should, everybody asked me, I, my husband said, you should have a YouTube, just show how people, how easy it is to make your, your children good food to eat. Yeah, I, I, I'm so busy with my current job already, I, I should come up with a cookbook. Maybe when I retire, I definitely look at out a cookbook for you. So, yeah. Go ahead. Would there be a situation where you would do supplements because my child eats literally 12 things and we've, mm -hmm. you know, we've tried yes. food therapy and, and he'll just go hungry rather than eat. So yes. like a micronutrient supplement or something? Yes, yes. Um, there's a, which is interesting because the next slide I'm talking about is a study that has been done by Johns Hopkins Hospital. Um, is they actually extract the broccoli sprouts and give it to kids. It's a very high concentration of broccoli sprouts and uh, uh, they did it to uh, 23 subjects and kids with autism they study. Um, they find out with the control group, which is the group that they have no supplements, and uh, the experiment group, which they give the supplement. The experiment group actually shows improvement in, in communication. The kids actually communicate more than the group without the broccoli extract. And it's a very high concentration. Usually kids don't even eat that much broccoli to get it in their diet. Um, so there is a little success here that we see. However, I want to point out that this is kind of a supervised uh, condition. And these kids, we actually find two of them actually um, in the experiment group actually have seizure. Uh, when we find no seizure on the control group, which is getting none of those. Uh, so I do want to point out that there is possibility of, when you give them just a pill, there is a possibility of side effect complications. Um, plus, the process of extracting all these uh, ingredients out from the food is cumbersome. We have to use chemical to extract them. My daughter is a, pharma, uh, is a uh, chemist, so we, we know that um, they have to use certain chemical to get those you know, chemical out. So how, how clean can we get rid of you know, the final product? So I still uh, recommend that if we can, I would find out in the 12 foods that your children would like to eat, you know, can we sneak it in some? And um, if you can you, you utilize your speech pathology, sometimes um, we do some therapy called um, uh, SOS approach. You know, we repeatedly encourage the kids uh, to try this, we desensitize them, and eventually, you know, they might try some new foods. And plus, we really want them to continue to keep an open mind to try the new foods. So what are the 12 foods that your kids will eat? Cucumber <laughs> uh, jelly, mm -hmm. chicken, yeah. you know, nothing particularly healthy, apples, mm -hmm. applesauce, yeah. raisins. Mm -hmm. Uh, so your kid probably is sensitive to yeah a um, lot of sensory issues early yes. on and, and feeding issues. Yes, so. yes. Mm, I would actually try to find out maybe your child is actually sensitive to the particular foods that you're currently feeding them. And for example, I find out a lot of kids with uh, food um, picky eater, they actually are sensitive to certain ingredient that they're eating, like casing. They're actually sensitive to the milk powder. And, and they will they will just go for the casing. They will just go for the milk product without knowing that it's
is actually detrimental to them. Um, we later on even find out that they may be even allergic to that. So, uh, like for example, the peanut butter. You might even want to, you know, will he take a bite of, or she take a bite of the peanut butter and look into it and see what, what's in there? Uh, no, mm -hmm. I mean, as long as it looks normal to mm -hmm. him, he's fine. Yeah, I would even recommend doing a little pureed fruit in there instead of doing jelly, um, you know, doing a little pureed raspberry in there or, you know, pureed um, yellow squash, <laughs> you know, just kind of look yellowish, blend in with the peanut butter. They usually are very sensitive to color and look. So if you can blend that in to their diet, they sometimes doesn't, they don't even know. Yeah, they won't, be, you know, reject. So keep trying. Yes. yes. I was just going to uh, say that we had similar issues with our child as far as trying to eat other things. Yes. And so what we had, somebody suggested to us is have a garden and grow it. And then if they plant it and they water it and then they sample it, yes. um, that actually worked for us. So now we actually uh, we can grow it or we can buy it. It doesn't matter either way and the, our children will eat it. Wow. Um, and so that's beautiful. That was a, uh, a little trick that we use. And to this day, our boys will walk outside in the backyard and grab it out of the garden and eat it no matter what it is now. Wow. They'll try it. So, yeah. Beautiful. That's get your kids participate. That's a one great thing to have them eating right. Um, if they start to make this food themselves, they will start to pay attention to actually, you know, to actually start liking it. So you know, you never know. You you might want to make an activity one day and just let's make a muffin. Do they like muffin? Just, yeah, just, not so much, <laughs> not so much either. Okay, good. Well, you know, like like I said, if you have them participate, even with the food preparation part of it, of course, if you try to hide in something to start with, you probably don't want them to know. But, you know, later on, have them participating. Yeah, yeah, that's a wonderful idea. Plant some cruciferous plants there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, arugula is very easy to grow. And because of the bitter uh, mess, uh, agent in there, they don't even you know, have much bugs <laughs> to bother them. You can do it organic easily. Yes. And broccoli, you know, and things like that. Very good. Yeah. Um, so my son, he has typical foods he eats, but he is, he kind of like has this really like bloated, big belly, really gassy all the time and stuff. Yes. And uh, I've been to three different dietitians, yes. and nobody wants to tell me about caloric intake or what he needs because everyone's like well he has this brain anomaly and some you know we don't know and he's always hand flapping always moving we don't know his metabolic rate and no one will really help me pinpoint all this he's been to like gastro he's had all that done there's nothing wrong mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but he's just gassy sulfur burps like yes. just you know so I'm just wondering um who would I see to like find out his metabolic rate or like if that's what they need, like how many calories does he need or like who should I go to, what, what mm -hmm. resource should I start with? Well, first of all, is your child um, small for age? No, age? no. no. Okay. Uh, normal height yes. and about 80% um, uh, for weight. For weight, 80%, okay. Yeah, maybe even closer to 90 now. Okay, so I am, Little surprise. Usually, the dietitian will be more than happy to calculate. Oh, which state are you going? I, actually, I'm from Canada. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Usually, how old is your child? Nine. Nine years old. Okay. Um, sometimes we calculate from their height. Um, you yeah. Know, sometimes we use IDA to kind of give us an, an example. You know. So your experience with ACC, though, it. It doesn't change. It should just be your regular chart. Like they're trying to say, oh, he's always moving, he's always stimming, so maybe there's something wrong with his metabolism. So they don't want to put a number to his caloric intake. Is that well, false then? Actually, I will still calculate. That's the yeah. number one thing that I would, well, when I see a child, you know, I would tell the parents, this is uh, where he is and this is what he needs at this point. Right. Um, Maybe you went to the hospital or you go to a clinic because through, through the doctor, like clinics. Oh, 
sometimes in the clinic they may not have enough time to sit down with you. Um, you might, yeah, it's a shame. You know, sometimes uh, they're just overworked and they have no time to just sit down and talk to you about your child's um, need. And uh, with the part though that he is still gassy right now, even with the um, low FODMAP diet. We haven't started the FODMAP. You I'm might, still investigating. Yeah, you might that. want to try that. Um, you might want to check it out with certain uh, dietitian if they're experienced in that. Uh, because I have a feeling that your child is sensitive to certain foods in their diet. And when they're not comfortable, they sometimes use food to comfort themselves. He never stops eating. Yeah. 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 He might just feel like, I am hungry again, without realizing that it's actually a pain issue. So maybe even try, you know, like not just lactose free milk, even try just no casein milk, like rice milk or coconut. What's your child being, um, being at the 80th percentile? You can use something like a coconut milk, you know, and fortify it with calcium and vitamin D, you know, and check that if that's making him more comfortable. Yeah, yeah, that's a very good question. You do, you do need, yeah, to know the caloric needs. If your child is 50 percentile for length, and Buck is 80 percentile for weight, her age, you pretty much um, are, you can drop the calorie actually in him. Um, because we, we, sh we should be able to match 50-50. Yeah. So continue to kind of work in that. Thank you. Any other question regarding this slide? OK. So yeah, oh, I haven't even finished this slide. So we, we need to uh, also look at uh, their diet. They usually are rich in uh, fish, uh, marine fish oil is very important uh, for our health. And as we know, um, fish sometimes is contaminated um, with mercury, so we do need to be careful. I generally recommend uh, mostly uh, only two kinds of fish. I do not like tuna. If we feed our children too much tuna, they actually can accumulate mercury in their body, and that's not good for our brain. Um, and so I actually generally um, recommend sardines and actually um, salmon, that is, you know, wild caught, um, or farm raised that's in a very contained um, environment so you have more of a non contaminated fish oil, omega 3 fatty acids. And seeds and nuts also provide good uh, omega 3, uh, 6 fatty acids for us. And fruits, high in anthocyanins. Those are the fruits that you like. You know, you look at them, they're purple in color, beautiful, uh, red, deep red, you know. Those are uh, pigments that's actually good for our brain health as well. So I do not really like to kind of just take a pill to give it to them. I actually use them as my food color. <laughs> so I end up using my blueberry for, you know, for the things that I like to make it blue. And I use beets for the, uh, you know, dessert that I like to make it red. You know, green, of course, I use kale or, you know, any kind of dark leafy green spinach uh, vegetables. So. And these are uh, the folate um, uh, rich foods. Uh, the folate, like I said, deficiency is associated with a spinal bifida condition. And the women usually uh, needs at least 400 to 600 micrograms per day, and the pregnant woman even more than that. A man is at least 400. So um, these are great uh, sources for you to try. One cup of this spinach will actually make you halfway there, more than halfway. So it's an easy way, isn't it? If you just stir fry your spinach a little bit, Half is done, not bad for the day, isn't it? <laughs> so, one raw spinach leaf already gives you 19. <laughs> I just throw it there because, you know, it's just great to know. One mango is 143 microgram. So, 
Believe it or not, one chicken, uh, one ounce of chicken liver actually gives us 159 micrograms. And it's very easy for kids sometimes, you know, to, I don't, I don't know how many of you are turned down by the liver pate. I am so sorry, I kind of passed the time, did I? <laughs> so, anyhow, sometimes kids with sensitivity issue or texture issue, making a liver pate actually is very nice for them. You can just spread on their little crackers and they can eat it just like that with, with their folic acid. So, <laughs> with a little greens, you can do a mango smoothie with just a little spinach in there, and then right away, you're up to 400. And a little soybean on the side. If your kids are not allergic to soy, you know, Chinese broccoli, you know, for dinner, you are off for a good day. Yeah, so start your children young, enjoy your greens. Thank you so much for your coming. Thank you very much.